Welcome to Chapter 12, Designing and Implementing Brand Architecture Strategies. So this is what we'll be going through today. And what this chapter basically does is it introduces and identifies factors that affect the successful launch of new products and services, and looks at the concepts of brand architecture, brand portfolios, and brand hierarchy, tools that can help us uh, as a company make the right decisions regarding branding strategy. So brand architecture strategy determines which brand elements they apply to new and existing products and services, which help consumers understand products and services and organize them in their minds. The brand product matrix is a graphical representation of all the products sold by a firm. Now, each of the matrix is labeled with a brand name. And you'll see each column represents a product. Thus, the, the rows of the matrix that you'll see soon correspond to brand lines, or the products sold under a particular brand name, while the columns correspond to product lines, also known as brand portfolios, or the brands marketed in particular product categories. Now, a firm's branding strategy can be characterized according to its breadth, which refers to the number of nature of products that bear the same brand name, and its depth, which is the, the nature of a number of brands in the same product category. So as marketers, we can use the brand product matrix to determine whether and where to make connections across brands and products. So this brand hierarchy visually illustrates the possible relationships that can be formed among the firm's products through the selection of common and distinctive brand elements. And the levels of the hierarchy might include the corporate or the company brand at the top, followed by a family brand used in more than one product category. An individual brand that typically is restricted to one product category, and a modifier that designates a specific item or model. Now, because a company's marketing activity may result in different types of associations becoming linked to the brand names at various levels of the hierarchy, each name has the potential to impact the equity of brands at levels above and below it. We'll finish off with looking at uh, corporate branding strategies, including corporate responsibility, image campaigns, and name changes. So, in regards to looking at the overall outline of the chapter, <coughs> the success of launch of new products and services is of paramount importance to a firm's long-term financial prosperity. And as firms, we must maximize brand equity across all the different brands and products and services that we offer. This brand strategy uh, architecture allows us to determine which brand elements we apply to our new and existing products and services. So therefore, consumers can understand products and services and organize them in their minds. Now, as a firm, we employ complex brand architecture strategies that are reflected in brand names, which consist of multiple brand name elements, and each element may signify an important aspect of a brand's architecture. So, brand portfolios and brand hierarchies help define relationships among brands and products and, and help characterize and formulate brand architecture strategies. So, corporate branding strategies and corporate image dimensions and specific issues associated with brand corporate management will be covered. Developing a brand architecture strategy. A firm's brand architecture strategy helps marketers determine which products and services to introduce, uh, which brand names, logos, symbols and so forth to apply to new and existing products. It defines the brand's breadth or boundaries and its depth or complexity. So the role of brand architecture is to clarify brand awareness and to improve brand image. So what are some of the steps in regards to this? Well, the first step is defining brand potential. The second step is identifying brand extension opportunities and then the third step 
is branding new products and services. Defining brand potential. Here there are three important characteristics, brand vision, brand boundaries and brand positioning. So articulating the brand vision or management's view of the brand long terms, brand's long term potential is influenced by how well the firm is able to recognise the current and possible future brand equity. A key aspect of changing brand equity and brand architecture are the shifting boundaries of the brand and many brands have transcended their initial market boundaries to become so much more. Now, sometimes marketers adopt a sequential approach to extending their brand, thereby gradually expanding brand meaning. But without a clear understanding of its current equity, it's difficult for us to understand what a brand could be built on. So therefore, Brand vision needs to be aspirational, so the, the brand has room to grow and improve in the future, yet it needs to be realistic. So brand vision relates to the higher order purpose of the brand, based on keen understanding of consumer aspirations and brand truths. And defining brand boundaries based on the brand vision and positioning, and identifying the products or services the brand should offer, the benefits it should supply, and the needs it should satisfy. So a broad brand is one with the abstract positioning that is able to support a higher order purpose and promise applicable in multiple product settings. It often has a transferable point of difference thanks to a widely relevant benefit supported by multiple reasons to believe or also to believe these supporting attributes. All brands have boundaries. So to improve market coverage, um, companies target different segments with multiple brands in a portfolio. Now, brand positioning puts some specificity into brand vision. So the four key ingredients, competitive frame of reference, points of difference, points of parity, and brand mantra. Now, the brand mantra should offer rational and emotional benefits and should be sufficiently robust to permit growth, relevant enough to drive consumer and retailer interest, and differentiated enough to sustain longevity. Identifying brand extension opportunities. So, determining the brand vision boundaries and positioning helps define the brand potential and provides a clear sense of direction for the brand. Step two is to identify new products and services to achieve that potential through a well-designed and implemented brand extension strategy. Now, a brand extension is a new product introduced under an existing brand name. Line extensions are new product introductions within existing categories. And category extensions are new product introductions outside of existing categories. So it's extremely important to carefully plan the optimal sequence of brand extensions to achieve brand potential. And launching a brand extension is harder than it might seem. The vast majority of new products and extensions, um, sorry, the vast majority of new products are extensions and the vast majority of new products fail. So therefore the implication is many brand extensions fail. Now, an increasingly competitive marketplace will be even more unforgiving to poorly positioned and market, market extensions in the years to come. Now, step three is specifying brand elements for branding new products and services. So the final step is Developing the brand architecture, we need to decide on the specific brand elements to use for any particular product or service associated with that brand. And one way to distinguish brand architecture strategies is by looking at whether a firm is employing an umbrella corporate or family brand for all its products, known as a branded house, or a collection of individual brands with individual names, known as a house of brands. Now, most firms adopt a strategy between the two endpoints, employing various types of sub-brands. A good 
branding strategy, you can tap associations and attitudes about the company or family brand as a whole, while also allowing for the creation of new brand beliefs to position the extension in the new category. Sub-brands play an important brand architecture role by signalling to consumers to expect similarities and differences in the new product. And in the absence of financial commitments to support discipline and consistent marketing that establishes brand meaning, we advise marketers to adopt the simplest brand hierarchy possible. So we should use brand portfolio analysis for step one, brand hierarchy for step two and three. Brand portfolio. Now, brand portfolios are all brands sold by a company in a product category. We, we judge a brand portfolio by its ability to maximize brand equity. Any one brand in the portfolio should not harm or decrease the equity of others. Uh, ideally, each brand maximizes equity in a combination with all other brands in the portfolio. And firms introduce multiple brands in the same category because no one brand is viewed equally favorably by all the different distinct market segments the firm would like to target. We can therefore pursue, pursue different price segments, channels of distribution, geographic boundaries, etc. They can increase shelf presence and retailer dependence in the store. They can attract consumers seeking variety who may otherwise switch to another brand. They can increase internal competition within the firm. They can yield economies of scale in advertising, sales, marketing, merchandising, and physical distribution. So what it means is that marketers need to trade off market coverage and other consideration with costs and profitability. Uh, portfolios too big if profits can be increased by dropping brands. It is not big enough if profits can be increased by adding brands. And brand lines with poorly differentiated brands are likely to be characterized by a lot of cannibalization and therefore we need pruning. Now the basic principle in designing a brand portfolio is to maximize market coverage so that no potential customers are ignored but to minimize brand overlap so brands aren't competing with each other for the same customer. Each brand should have its own target market and its own positioning. So there are some special roles of brands in the brand portfolio. Flankers. Flankers or fighter brands typically create strong points of parity with competitors' brands so that more important and more profitable flagship brands can retain their desired positioning. Now, fighters must not be so attractive that they take sales away from their higher price comparison brands. And if they are connected to other brands in the portfolio in any way, they must not be designed so cheaply that they reflect poorly on these other brands. Cash cows. Um, cash cows hold on to a sufficient number of customers and maintain their profitability with virtually no marketing support. And as marketers, we can effectively milk these cash cows by capitalizing on their reservoir of existing brand equity. For example, um, you know, Netflix DVD service still actually has loyal customers, though it is, as you can see, obviously starting to be phased out. low-end, entry-level, or high-end prestige brands. Now, these leverage associations from other brands and just distinguish themselves on price and quality. Um, low-end brands attract customers to the brand franchise, and high-end brands add prestige and credibility to the entire portfolio. So, to sum up, we need to minimize overlap and get the most out of each portfolio. Brand hierarchies. A brand hierarchy is a useful means of graphically portraying a firm's branding strategy by displaying the number and nature of common and distinctive brand elements across the firm's products, revealing their explicit ordering. We can brand a product in different ways depending on how many new and existing brand elements we use, and we can combine them for any one product. So, the simplest way is 
we can look at things like a, um, a top to bottom. So corporate or company brand, family brand, individual brand, a modifier, a designating item or model, and a product description. Levels of brand hierarchy. Now, corporate or company brand level is one brand, and for legal reasons, it almost always must be present somewhere on the product or the package. Now, some firms use the corporate brand while it's virtually invisible in other firms. And the corporate image is the consumer association that the company has to the consumer, making the product or providing the service. So it's extremely important. Family brand level. Family brand level or range brand or umbrella brand is used in more than one product category, but it's not necessarily the name of the company or the corporation. So most firms typically support only a handful of family brands. And marketers can apply family brands instead of corporate brands if products are too dissimilar to fit with one company brand, or if they want to link common associations to multiple distinct products. Now, firms have to support marketing programs of family brands and they may become weaker and less favourable. Individual brand level. Individual brands are restricted to one product category, but can be customised and supported by marketing activity to meet the needs of a specific customer group. All brand elements can focus on a certain target market. And if the brand fails, the risk to other brands or the company is quite minimal. But it's difficult and complex and expensive to develop separate marketing programs to develop separate levels, sorry, sufficient levels of brand equity. Modifier levels. Now, modifier means to designate a specific item or model type or a particular version or configuration of the product. And adding a modifier can signal refinements or differences among brands related to factors such as quality levels, attributes and functions, etc. Uh, modifiers can help make products more understandable and relevant to consumers and even the trade. Uh, they can become trademarks if they can develop a unique association with a parent brand. Product descriptors. Product descriptors may not be a brand element, but it might be an important ingredient of branding strategy because it helps consumers understand what the product is and does and who it competes with. Designing the right brand hierarchy is crucial. So brand elements at each level of the hierarchy um, may contribute to brand equity and this is through their ability to create awareness and foster strong, favourable and unique brand associations and also positive responses. Now there are some challenges. What are some of the challenges? Well. Um, the specific products to be introduced for any one brand. And that's a decision we need to make. We need to also decide the number of levels of the hierarchy to use. We need to look at the desired brand awareness and image at each level. And the combination of brand elements from different levels of the hierarchy, if any, to use for any one particular specific product. Uh, the best way is to link any one brand element at all to multiple products. So, when deciding which products introduce, the principles of growth, survival and synergy can help guide our decisions. And the principle of growth maintains that investments in market penetration or expansion versus product development for a brand should be made according to ROI principles. And the principle of survival states that brand extensions must achieve brand equity in their own categories, avoiding me too extensions. The principle of synergy states that brand extensions should enhance the equity of the parent brand. Now, given
product boundaries and an extension strategy in place, the first decision to make is which level or levels of the branding hierarchy do we use? Now, most firms choose to use more than one level, so they can communicate additional specific information about products and because developing brands at high levels of the hierarchy is economical. The, the practice of combining an existing brand with a new brand is called sub-branding or hybrid branding. And sub-branding can create a strong connection to the, to the company or the family brand and allows for the creation of brand-specific beliefs. Uh, sub-brands can help organise selling efforts. And marketers can employ a host of brand elements as part of a sub-brand. So the principle of simplicity is based on the need to provide the right amount of branding information to consumers. No more, no less. The, the desired number of levels of the brand hierarchy depends on the complexity of the product line or the product mix. Achieving the desired level of awareness and strength, favourability and uniqueness of brand associations may take some time and call for a considerable change in customer perceptions. Now, the principles of relevance and differentiation should guide the brand knowledge creation process. The principle of relevance is based on the advantages of efficiency and economy. The greater value of an association in the firm's marketing, the more efficient and economical it is to consolidate meaning into one brand linked to all products. The more abstract the association, the more likely it is to be relevant in different product settings. And benefit associations can cut across product categories. So the principle of differentiation is based on the disadvantages of redundancy. Uh, a flagship product is one that represents or embodies the brand to consumers. And combining brand elements from different levels can work, but we need to decide how much emphasis to give to each. Now the prominence of a brand element is its relative visibility compared with other brand elements. And the principle of prominence states that the relative performance of the brand elements determines which become the primary ones and which one the secondary ones. So primary brand elements should convey the main product positioning and points of difference. And secondary brand elements convey a more restricted set of supporting associations, such as points of parity or additional points of difference. The more prominent The more prominent the brand element, the more emphasis consumers will give in informing their brand opinions. Now, a brand endorsement strategy uses a brand element on the package, sign or product, but does not include it in the brand name. It establishes maximum distance between the corporate or family brand and the individual brand. Uh, as marketers, we can use the branding strategy screen to dial up or dial down different brand elements. And brand elements may be linked to multiple products based on the principle of commonality. Corporate branding. Uh, a corporate brand is distinct from a product brand because it encompasses a wider range of associations. A corporate brand may be more likely to evoke associations of common products and their shared attributes or benefits, people and relationships, programs and values, and also corporate credibility. Now, building a strong corporate brand can necessitate that the firm keep a high public profile to influence and shape some of the more abstract associations. As a, fair, as a firm, we need to be willing to subject ourselves to scrutiny and we need to be extremely transparent in our values, our activities and programs. Now, a corporate brand offers a host of potential marketing advantages if corporate brand equity is caref carefully built and nurtured. This corporate brand equity is the differential response by consumers and customers, employees, other firms, or any other relevant constituency to the words, actions, communications, products or services provided by an identified corporate brand equity. Corporate image dimensions. 
a corporate or company brand may evoke strong associations to a product attribute the type of user the usage situation or overall judgment now if a corporate brand is linked to products across diverse categories some of its strongest associations are likely to be intangible attributes abstract benefits or attitudes that span each of the different product categories a uh, high quality corporate image association creates perceptions that a company makes products of the highest quality an innovative corporate image association creates consumer perceptions of a company as developing new and unique marketing programs, especially with respect to product introductions or improvements. So, corporate image associations might reflect characteristics of the employees of the company. Service employees and retail employees can affect brand equity, but a toxic culture can also affect brand equity. A customer-focused corporate image association creates consumer perceptions of a company as responsive to and caring about its customers. Now, corporate image associations uh, may reflect company values and programs that do not always directly relate to the products. Firms can run corporate image ad campaigns to describe to consumers and employees their philosophy and actions with respect to organisational, social, political or economic issues. Now, a socially responsible corporate image portrays the company as contributing to community programs, uh, supporting artistic and social activities, and attempting to improve the welfare of society as a whole. Now, an environmental concern linked to a corporate image projects a company whose products protect or improve the environment and make more effective use of scarce natural resources. So, corporate credibility is an important set of abstract brand associations that depend on three factors. Corporate expertise, corporate trustworthiness, and corporate likability. Now, a highly credible company might be treated more favorably by other external constituencies. Uh, a strong corporate reputation can help a firm survive a brand crisis and avert public outrage that could depress sales or block expansion plans. Managing the corporate brand. Now, corporate social responsibility, corporate image campaigns and corporate name changes are specific issues that arise in managing a corporate brand the role of a firm in society, how it treats its employees, shareholders, local neighbours and other stakeholders can impact greatly on consumer purchase decisions. Uh, corporate image campaigns are designed to create associations to the corporate brand as a whole. So they tend to ignore or downplay individual products or sub-brands. Uh, a number of different objectives are possible in a corporate brand image campaign with the first three being particularly critical in terms of building customer-based brand equity. So what we're trying to do is build a brand awareness of the company and the nature of its business, create favourable latitudes and perceptions of company credibility, link beliefs that can be leveraged by product-specific marketing, and make a favourable impression on the financial community. Uh, we can motivate our current employees and attract better employees, and influence public opinion on issues. Now, a corporate image campaign might be useful when mergers or acquisitions transform the company. And brand line campaigns promote a range of products associated with a brand line. Now, corporate names may have to change for a number of reasons, but they should be the right reasons pursued the right way. Um, a merger or acquisition is often the reason to look at naming strategies and there are many nuances to identifying brand names for acquisition uh, we could look at the science of branding 12.3 here from the chapter uh, we might get rid of brands we could have leveraged buyouts or the sale of assets may also necessitate brand name changes so also significant shifts in corporate strategy 
Now, renaming can yield growth opportunities, but name changes are complicated, time consuming and expensive. We should evaluate candidate names in terms of memorability, meaningfulness, likability, protectability, adaptability and transferability. Now, if the consumer market is a primary objective, the name may reflect or be suggestive of certain product characteristics, benefits or values. So, once the firm has chosen a new name, it needs to be introduced to stakeholders and the public carefully and with research. Brand Architecture Guidelines Now, brand architecture is a classic example of the art and science of marketing. It's important to establish rules and conventions and to be disciplined and consistent. Uh, it's also important to be flexible and creative. So brand hierarchy may not be symmetric. Uh, our corporate objectives, our consumer behavior, or competitive activity may dictate significant deviations in branding strategy. And brand elements may receive more or less emphasis or not be present at all, depending on the products and the markets. So here there are six guidelines that you can see in front of you. So let's sum up overall what we've talked about. Well, what we need to do is this key aspect of managing brand equity is picking the right brand strategy. We have this brand product matrix, which is a graphical representation of all of our brands and products. We might offer multiple brands in a category to look at attracting different segments. The brand hierarchy looks at an explicit ordering of all the brand names. We might have corporate or family brands and in here we can establish valuable associations.